Hi, my name is Dr. Colleen McGinnon. I'm a senior resilience specialist with the Institute for Social and Environmental Transitions. We are a small action research NGO, uh, all remote staff. Uh, there's a concentration in Boulder, Colorado, but I am pre-recording this session because I live in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, and it's about 3 a.m. for me. Um, nevertheless, delighted to be here um, through the miracle of technology, and my colleague, Kanmani Venkateswaran, will also be attending the entire conference and is here to take questions. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you here and um, present a brief presentation on raising the bar, um, um, designing, monitoring, and evaluating climate resilience. Um, what we as evaluators can do to advance climate change policy and praxis, and what are the, some of the methodological challenges that we're dealing with? Um, First of all, a lot of people tend to think of m and &E in, in sort of a one big lump. It's, it's m and &E together. Monitoring and evaluation actually do two different things, and they're very complementary, which is why they get lumped together. Um, but I always approach all m and &E work, and especially evaluations, with, with two overarching questions. One is the job of really monitoring. Um, are we doing things right? Are the trains running on time? Are we meeting our targets? staying on budget, getting through the work plan, all of that day-to-day -day project management stuff that's really important because we need to be accountable to senior management, to our donors um, and everything else, everyone else. Um, this information though, however useful it is for day-to-day -day project management is not always very interesting from a learning perspective. And that's where sort of evaluation comes in with the larger question, which is, are we doing the right things? These are matters of, um, of strategy, of effectiveness. Are the interventions actually making a difference on the ground and ultimately having impact and generating significant change? Um, so that's m and &E. I like to think of it in terms of DML though, which is design, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And the design and the learning are sort of the bookends to this process because monitoring and evaluation ultimately rests on your program design. And then learning is learning from experience, generating evidence um, and using it to inform decision-making, whether it's internal in, in terms of management or donors to a program, but also broadly to an external, um, to an external audience. I think DML is especially essential from a climate resilience perspective. Um, and some of the issues are that um, the, qu the question of what sets climate resilience apart from business as usual, uh, particularly in a sector that's Easy is easily and obviously related to climate and weather conditions, such as agriculture. Um, early on, in, when climate change adaptation was, was emerging as a, as a body of practice, um, there was a huge fixation on, so what are the indicators and how do we count this? Um, and that those efforts, while important, and there's still very, very important ongoing efforts, so I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to downplay the significance of that. Ultimately, climate resilience and climate change adaptation don't have a metric. There's nothing to count. It's, it's how many units of adaptation do I have? Uh, how much more climate resilience am I because I went to some workshop? Um, we don't have anything specific to count. And although climate change is a global pro problem, climate resilience is fundamentally local. It depends on context and situation and the intersection of climate hazards with population vulnerability. And all of this comes together in a climate rationale in the program design phase. This is where um, you know, the, the program is explained in terms of how it affects or addresses uh, or reflects um, these, these thorny questions about specific climate, has, climate hazards, their intersection with, with population vulnerability, and how this intervention 
is going to change something, something important. The climate rationale is what sets climate resilience programming apart from business as usual. And it's critical and it's key. We don't, by contrast, um, have a very good track record with sort of doing stuff, say, this is our agriculture program. And uh, five years later going, so what did we achieve from a climate perspective? Um, there's, no, there's nothing to count. And if you don't have a climate strategy, your, your m and &E framework is not gonna actually get at this um, from a climate perspective. Um, it's also really critical to harness monitoring and evaluation to build a global evidence base on effective climate action. Um, this is a new problem. This is a brand new problem. Um, and that means we don't have an established body of best practice. Everybody is experimenting. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that the most funded body of research, of applied research on what constitutes effective climate action is monitoring and evaluation. But if it, we're gonna make that powerful research, uh, we've gotta make our reports and our evaluations um, tackle big questions, not just, you know, did we meet our targets? Did we, um, how many, how many beneficiaries do we have? You know, how'd you manage COVID? Uh, were there delays? Uh, we need to be tackling, tackling big questions of what does this achieve from a climate perspective in a way that meets the urgency of the global climate threat? Because we've got one generation to figure this out. And frankly, we're not. And a lot of the reason why we're not is that there's quite a bit of business as usual, sustainable development programming, um, however excellent it is in many ways, um, but it, it's often being framed as climate adaptation and climate resilience when it's really not, it's not convincingly or not strongly so. And if we're going to meet the urgency of the glo global climate threat, we've got to figure out what is effective from a climate perspective. And m and &E is one of our most powerful potential tools to build that evidence base and inform that decision making. Um, I wanted to touch very briefly on um, a couple of sort of practical things to bear in mind about results frameworks and indicators. First of all, as I mentioned a moment ago, there is no metric count. Uh, there's no bottom line for climate resilience. It's an idea. It's an idea with lots of different ideas and it, what constitutes climate resilience shifts from one place to the others. So uh, trying to find this magic single um, in indicators or standardized set of indicators is quite frankly chasing a chimera. Um, you know, the, the indicators are important, they're critical, but they're data points. Um, and because, because climate resilience is a poor methodological fit for certain things, um, we, have to, we have to think beyond individual indicators and measurement and think in terms of strong, sound theories of change that inform the program design. And that program design is then distilled into a tailored results um, framework. Um, also a big yes to tackling the complex cross-cutting questions surrounding gender and social inclusion, rights-based approaches, and or climate justice. Um, and above all, I think it's time that the, um, uh, to embrace the, uh, the, uh, the long overdue backlash um, around obsessive measurement disorder. This is a technical term. It's been defined as the intellectual fallacy that counting things improves decisions. Um, let's count what needs to be counted and analyze that quantitative data judiciously. But um, in the words of Albert Einstein, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. Um, um, endlessly quantifying things because then it's smart. Um, can be actually problematic in many re respects because when you're dealing with large complex questions of systems change, scale, and uh, soft aims, what I mean by soft is not 
so tangible ones, for example, climate justice. Um, you have to you have to step back a little bit from the indicators and present it in terms of research questions. Um, I'm running out of time here already. Let me move along quickly. I think that there's two pillars of uh, climate change programming. One is the mainstreaming of climate into sustainable development. This is critical. This is key. This is infusing sustainable development with, um, with some climate perspectives and climate considerations. Very important. Um, and this is being led very strongly, especially by um, some of the bilateral donors who are systematically um, mainstreaming climate into all of their development programming. Um, what I see though is a lot of programs or, or a lot of organizations rather that have done a great job with mainstreaming and then they're looking towards sort of climate specific funding and climate specific money, um, you know, green climate fund. And now we're gonna get $20 million. Um, but I think it's important to bear in mind the climate dedicated finance has to be, sets a much higher bar than mainstreaming climate into sustainable development. They're reaching towards transformational change from a climate perspective, climate-centered policy and praxis, very, very strong climate rationales, and fundamentally forging new development pathways. Also very important and critical. I think we need both the mainstreaming and the transformational change agendas. Um, but what I'm saying is we need them both because they do different things and they complement each other. Um, but they both also present very different m and &E challenges, um, but also opportunities on how to define, um, define what constitutes effective action from a climate perspective and move forward with that. Um, in terms of methods and approaches for both mainstreaming and transformational change, some of the trends that um, are happening, uh, including a, a reach beyond accountability, focused evaluations and embracing much more learning driven ones, those that are led by research questions rather than targets and indicators. Um, embracing theory, not because I have a fancy PhD and it sounds good, but theory is simply a framework that explains and predicts change. Um, and because we have a new problem with um, an evidence base that's only emerging, Theory is the best thing that we've got to work with. It's our most powerful tool. Uh, and we're all experimenting. Um, so embracing theory-based evaluations that tackle the complex, complex questions is critical. Um, and I wanted to touch upon two trends in m and &E that I think are, are balancing out some of um, some of the approaches that, that, that quite a few organizations and individuals have, have become frustrated with, which is that you know, the individual smart indicators, they're too, they're too narrow and they sometimes don't say very much. Um, as Kusak and Risk put it in uh, their fantastic manual, 10 Steps to Results-Based Management, the so what factor. You know, so you've trained all the people and you've instituted the reforms, you've done this and this and this, so what? Where's the impact? The so what question is, where is impact? And the two trends towards that um, seem opposite, but they're actually complementary because they both tackle complexity. One is big data, big complex statistical uh, data analysis, not just baseline and endline, but like what's going on from a change perspective. And then the other side of that coin is nuanced, qualitative um, research, qualitative evaluations. Um, quickly, an example in action uh, that I wanted to highlight from ISA International. I was team leader on this global portfolio evaluation of the Climate Justice Resilience Fund. This is a foundation, so um, um, it's allowed to be a little bit uh, edgier than some of the government money. It issues a diverse collection of grants spanning community-based projects to global advocacy. And this entire evaluation was driven by research questions, not by indicators, and based on narrative research methods, which simply begin by inviting 
participants to tell the story of their experience and what has been achieved, what has been achieved and what's been changed and how. And this was systematically analyzed to demonstrate best practices and lessons learned of diverse interests. We came up with a lot of really, really interesting things. Um, and um, it, was, it was a delight to work with this foundation, um, both, on the, both on the evaluation, but also particularly in terms of pushing, pushing the edge of what we know about how to address and how to embrace and how to fund community-based climate resilience. Um, again, m and &E is here as a tool to raise that bar. We're, our research helps set the standards on what constitutes effective climate action. And if we go beyond our sort of day-to-day -day quarterly report or annual report or more routine work, which is essential and important, but um, if we take a few extra steps to harness m and &E, um, I think we can really advance global climate policy and practice. Thank you very much. I'm gonna hand it over to Gan Money for questions.